valuable okay. than my questions would be. So, but well, you can definitely intro yourself first. Well, so let's just uh, talk about this. My, my name is Vince Cerf. I'm Google's chief internet evangelist, and I'm one of the co-inventors of the internet. Today, we're at UCLA at Royce Hall. We've been celebrating the 50th anniversary of the interconnection of the first two machines on the predecessor to the internet called the ARPANET. And I was around at UCLA at the time that connection was made, literally oh. 50 years ago. So now fast forward, let's look at the internet today and what we're doing with it and how simultaneously impressive and scary it is that over that 50 year period, we have become increasingly dependent on the infrastructure that we call internet and the devices that deliver it to us. So as an example, um, we were going to try to do this inter interview uh, <laughs> using Wi-Fi at the university, but we couldn't find a login to get onto the Wi-Fi service. And, and one Wi-Fi network blocked streaming yeah. so that you yeah. couldn't stream Netflix. Right. Yeah, for example. So, I mean, uh, so here's a case where we assume that the infrastructure is there, but it turned out it isn't in the form that we needed. So I was relating uh, another experience I had recently. It was uh, order, ordered, I decided to order a Chinese dinner and then pick it up and bring it home. And so I used my uh, mobile first to find restaurants in the area that offered Chinese food. Then I needed directions to get there, so I fired up Google Maps and it steered me to the right restaurant. I picked up the food and I drove back and we had a nice Chinese dinner. But as I was driving, I was thinking about all the things that had to have worked in order for that entire scenario to play out with such convenience. And then I got to thinking, well, what would happen if some parts of that cascade of dependency hadn't worked? What if my mobile ran out of power? Yeah, that obviously is a problem. <laughs> uh, what if the system that was doing the search didn't find anything or, or, it, or I couldn't get to Google? or I couldn't get to Google Maps, or I couldn't make a phone call. Um, we pack an enormous amount of functionality into these things we call smartphones, which by the way were invented essentially in the form of the iPhone from Apple only 12 years ago. Oh, that's crazy to think and about. And so 12 years is not very long for us to become so deeply dependent on literally hundreds of applications that are residing inside our mobile phones or our laptops or our pads. So it's this dependency that worries me because when it isn't available, all kinds of assumptions that you could do something uh, stop working properly. For example, maybe people don't know how to read maps anymore because they've become very accustomed to turn-by-turn -turn guidance from Google Maps or Waze or some other similar That's application. So and so if the uh, signal goes away, I mean, suppose you're in a topography where the radio signal fails, Suddenly, you don't know where you are, you don't know where to go, and you don't know what to do. Uh, there's an example of this in uh, Boston, for example. They did the so-called Big Dig. <laughs> where it took them 10 years. They dug uh, essentially tunnels under Boston oh to get traffic off the surface wow. and so that they could carry through traffic uh, through the city without interfering with pedestrians and other kinds of on-the-surface traffic. And well, that's all terrific and wonderful, except that when you finally get into the tunnel, you lose satellite access. Oh, and so no. your, your little satellite thing says, <gasps> lost satellite connectivity, don't know where we are, don't know how to tell you where to turn, and in particular, how to get out. Oh, no. So I mean, these are sort of gotchas yeah. that, that show up. Um, so I worry that we're building a world which has a fragile character to it. It's dependent on power. Mm -hmm. electrical power. It's dependent on a lot of software which may have bugs in it. Mm -hmm. It's dependent on a large number of independently built and operated components for the entire system to function. So, uh, for example, if you do a Google search, you're, you're depending on the mobile, if, let's use a mobile as an example, you're depending on the mobile communications provider to be working. Right. You're depending on them to deliver your query to the internet. You're dependent on the internet to deliver the query to Google, if we use Google as an example. You're depending on all the functionality of Google to have worked, including its uh, previous indexing of the entire World Wide Web, because mm -hmm. that's how Google search works. Yeah. It indexes the thing on a continuous basis, builds this enormous database saying, here are all the web pages that have these words on them. 
Right. And when you do a query, it tries to figure out which web pages have answers for you. Yeah. So and then it has to deliver that answer to you. And if it happens to be a question about how do I get from A to B, then you need it to continue to run. You need continuous connectivity on your mobile in order to get the information about turn by turn right. routing. And it, you can multiply this by any number of things. What about buying something on Amazon? You know, what about the banking transaction? Mm -hmm. When you start thinking about all the pieces that provide us with convenience, and you realize how easy it would be for that to become disrupted, scary. then you start to get a little scared. Mm -hmm. And we have headline reports all the time about vulnerabilities of software that are exploited by the bad guys. So those of us who are in the software world are deeply concerned about building more resilient, robust, and resistant systems that will avoid some of the uh, fragility that, uh, that we can already see in this current environment. So. Uh, from my point of view, we need people to be thinking about building a much more resilient system than yeah. what we have today, especially if we're going to have billions of devices that are programmable, the so-called Internet of Things, whether it's a toaster or a refrigerator or something else. I used to tell people that my biggest worry was a headline that says, 100,000 refrigerators attack Bank of America. <laughs> you know, Aha, isn't that funny? Well, it's not funny anymore because... A couple of years ago, the uh, Dine Corporation was attacked by a half a million um, webcams that had been formed into a botnet. Now think about a webcam. What it does is, is it's, it's a video camera that right. transmits a megabit per second video stream to some target. If you can get control over the webcam and have it send its video stream to some place on the net that you want to knock over, if you have 500,000 of them they're all sending their megabit per second video streams to the same target. If you do the math, it's 500 gigabits a second. 500 gigabits a second. It's 500 billion bits a second. So this company, Dine Corporation, was knocked over by this denial of service attack. Now that wouldn't have been so bad, except Dine Corporation was resolving domain names for a whole bunch of other important companies. Domain name resolution is how you find your way around in the internet. If you type www.google.com, the domain name system translate that into, translates that into a numerical internet protocol address, which the system, the internet, uses to figure out how to get your traffic to the right Google server. Right. Well, if the DNS lookup fails because the organization that was doing the supporting it has fallen over because of a denial of service attack, all the companies that were relying on Dine Corporation suddenly disappear off the net. They're not visible anymore because oh. nobody can find the address that they're supposed to be at. So I worry that we are building this increasingly fragile future and we, and we need to be much more thoughtful about dealing with some of the fragility. Now, just to give you another scare, I want you to <laughs> just, well, it's important, it's important. It is so, yeah. It's important to know that engineers are worried about stuff like this. Thank God. <laughs> because, because it's a problem and they like to solve problems. So let's think about digital content that you generate and care about. How about all the photographs that you take? Those are digital objects. What about documents that might be important to you, like a deed, or maybe it's a letter from a family member, or, how or many it's times an email? Do you put your social security you into all forms. Kinds of things. So now imagine all those digital objects are really important to you, and they might be important to your descendants. Mm. So think of all the family photographs and things like that. So now let's imagine it's 100 years from now. It's 2119. And you're long gone, but your descendants are curious about all those 1.2 billion pictures that you took during your lifetime. The question is, will they actually be accessible to your descendants? And we don't know for sure. Where, first of all, where are they? Second, how are they encoded? A piece of software is needed to take the digital version of an image and render it so you can read it. Right. Just like a spreadsheet requires a piece of software in order to interact with the spreadsheet. If you don't have the software that knows how the spreadsheet is formatted and how to interact with it, it's a useless bag of bits. Yeah. So how do we preserve functionality, software functionality, for hundreds of years? Huh. And the answer is, well, we don't know for sure how to do that. Some ideas are to simulate the or emulate hardware so you can run old operating systems and old software to interpret old digital objects. Another possibility is to somehow 
translate them into something that can be correctly interpreted with new software and new operating systems in the future. Uh, but there are no regular practices right now for doing this on a regular basis, especially for information that you care greatly about. And apart from family, uh, you know, emails and images and maybe favorite uh, songs and other things <laughs> like that, the other documents you might care about, like you mentioned, social security numbers, medical information, mm -hmm. uh, deeds to property, other ownership things like your car ownership, all that stuff needs to be preserved digitally. And if it doesn't get preserved, it's like a digital dark age. Right. So there isn't enough work going on right now to think all the way through in this long-term fashion. So you can see two problems. One of them is short-term dependency on very complex infrastructure, which when it doesn't work causes you a great deal of annoyance <laughs> and maybe even harm. <laughs> And then there's this long-term problem of preserving digital content, and even there we don't have regularized practices and standards to uh, assure that those data will be available. If it's scientific data, it's an even more big issue because you want to hang on to that scientific right. data and refer to it even if it's 100 years old because sometimes you have theories that will allow you uh, to reinterpret older data and to extract more knowledge from it. So it was a big hoo-ha when we <laughs> discovered that we couldn't find some of the data from the Mars missions that took place in 1976. We had two uh, Viking landers landed on Mars successfully. Then everything didn't work for 20 years <laughs> until uh, 1997 when uh, the um, Pathfinder rover landed on Mars successfully. And then there were other, in 2004, the two big Spirit and Opportunity landed and the Mars Science Laboratory and so on. So hoping to gather all that data and preserve it and remember what it meant. Right. Suppose you have a file full of numbers, but what if you forgot to write down, oh, that's pressure or temperature or you know percentage of this kind of radioactive material versus that kind. If you didn't write down the metadata, the, the preservation of the numbers doesn't help you. Yeah. So metadata preservation is just as important as, present, uh, pre uh, <laughs> as, as preserving the uh, actual data, so you know what it means and how it needs to be interpreted, what software might be needed in order to manipulate it. So I have all these big headaches that uh, I worry about, and yeah. you should be worried about it too. I am now. <laughs> I am now. <laughs> Thank you so much. You're welcome. I'm, well, I'm really glad that we caught that. Even well, me too. I mean, at least it's an opportunity. It wasn't quite what we were looking for, but yeah. those are two topics that are worthy of attention. It's still very valuable. Yeah, very, very valuable. And I hope that I hope that I'm d I'm definitely going to think about this a lot more. Good. Well, <laughs> and we want your listeners to think about it too. Exactly. And uh, and I hope you guys get a little scared too. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Bye. Bye.